How's everyone doing? Good, good. I'm glad my Zoom is not lagging. Everything's good. Where's the camera from the, in the four space? Or do you guys? You, um, I mean, I see you on the screen. Oh, I mean, behind people walking behind in the in the big screen. That's just that's facing the hall building. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So that's that sculpture that you're seeing there on the corner of the hall building. So. Yes, I see. It's very nice. Yeah. I feel so official. I know. Let me think I got everything. All righty, bonjour et bienvenue tout le monde on behalf of the Fourth Space team and the new initiative to Black Community Health Check. We are streaming on YouTube live from Concordia University's Fourth Space, located on unseen indigenous lands in Jojage, Montreal. As caretakers for the lands and waters we are meeting on today, we are grateful to the Kanyankahaga Nation for their teachings about the earth and our relations. At Fourth Space, we collaborate with our university community to bring people together around the research projects, initiatives, and dialogues and development across the university. And this week, we're so pleased to have the opportunity to collaborate with Annick Mogil Flavien, who's a PhD student here at Concordia, to host this week's series of events focused on black community health in the home, the community, and healthcare facilities. Um, now, to get us started in this first conversation, Anik will be speaking to Alicia Maxwell Sarasua, and I'll pass it to you both to introduce yourselves. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm so excited to be part of this conversation and to begin the week. Um, well, let me first introduce uh, our guest, um, PhD student at Concordia University, a Black community advocate, a creative maker, a caregiver, a mother, a daughter. Her research explores Black community health in Montreal with a qualitative focus on the importance of structures of care within Black homes as determinant of overall Black community health. She's a three-time graduate of Concordia University, where she's also, she founded the Black Perspectives Office, uh, served as co-chair on the President's Task Force on Anti-Black Racism, and developed cross-community anti-discriminatory consultations, workshops, and trainings. And this, this, we're not over. We're not over yet. Most recently, she founded and leads the new initiative, a research collective that examines social disparities from the Black-centric perspective. New is a Haitian Creole pronoun that translates to we, us, and ours. So thank you so much for being in this space. And I'm so excited to be here to ask you all my questions to get it all up in your business. Um, my name is Alicia and I'm a recent um, graduate of Concordia in political science. And I um, closely work with Anik last year and the year before that as on the President's Task Force, as well as with the BPO as a student intern. So I'm really excited to be here to talk about um, wellness in the Black community, as this is such a passion of mine. Um, and so, yes, let's get started. Thank you so much. I appreciate that intro. And it is also ex extremely exciting because of the fact that we've worked together so much to have you um, be the one kind of leading this conversation with me. Yeah, I love it. And especially because it's at a new angle, we've definitely spoke about the Black community on campus, um, but not about uh, health in the Black community. So I'm really excited to dig in um, with that. So I want to begin with why does, let me, um, let me begin with what's your interest in the Black community? Where does that come from? Hmm. Um, yeah, it's interesting. It's really recently-ish, let's say, in, in terms of my lifespan that I've been using the word um, black more commonly. Um, so my parents are Haitian, um, my dad was a political exile, and my mom was a form of political exile in the sense that my grandmother sent her away because she was really concerned that she wouldn't be able to um, well, continue to live in a place like Haiti where um, when my mom is such a vocal person and, um, and it's, yeah, you know, Haiti has been through so many waves of really difficult polit political situations um, and so my grandma sent her away. <laughs> so she was a different form of political exile. And uh, I grew up in a home where, um, you know, my parents were 
writing articles for newspapers at the dining room table. There was, you know, they prepped for radio, community radio shows at the house. There were like always people in and out of the house. Like I, I had a very clear sense of black activism, activism from a really young age, but it was very um, Haitian centric, right? So mm -hmm. I, can, I grew up with a sense that I am very Haitian and not mm -hmm. necessarily very black. Um, and then uh, I went to English schools um, in Cotenege and um, had a series of my own encounters with my blackness in Montreal and, you know, blackness in um, the negative connotation of like how people see me as mm. black. Um, and, and so that was really hard and it, and it happened really young, right? Like I think my first like major solo experience, um, I was 12 years old, like arrested on the carry, like this very chaotic um, situation. And so uh, having that be like a parallel experience to this um, other side of blackness that is so culturally rooted and so um, empowering and um, connected to ancestry and so, so on, um, I kind of spent my teenage years being very like, um, well, right, angry <laughs> at the end of the day. Like I spent a lot of time being angry and trying to understand what that meant for me. Um, and then it, once I got to my 20s, I think I've, I was, you know, blessed enough to, to realize that I, I could use this to my advantage, right? I don't have, this doesn't have to be something that is imposed on me. It's something I can also decide to choose as a, as a connection point with uh, community members around me. I can choose to, um, to flip the narrative really, you know, and, and to be as subversive as I, as I want to be with it. And so um, from then on, I did a lot of work um, in and outside of Concordia. Like I've been a student at Concordia since I was 21, I think. And, um, and I've had a lot of great opportunities. I've had some um, profs that really allowed me to do all types of work that I was really interested in. And so um, I got to figure out what my voice was in terms of blackness. Mm -hmm. um, and it's very different than like a Haitian activist voice. Um, it's very different from what I grew up with. It is, um, it's bilingual, it's Montreal rooted, it's, um, it's in connection with um, the ever-changing landscape of blackness in Montreal, right? Mm -hmm. So we know as immigration changes, the landscape of what blackness means in Montreal changes from sector to sector and, and all of that. And so, um, yeah, so my sense of black identity is very fluid, which I think is different than what I was raised with. Um, and it's made me very, uh, it's made me very embracing of the term. Mm -hmm. um, and I've tried to use it as much as possible in the work that I do um, in order to kind of um, bring to together different perspectives, right? And, and see how we can move forward together without kind of erasing our, our unique um, experiences and our unique kind of um, traje trajectories and ancestry and, and so on and so forth. So yeah, so that's I, I think where my interest in black community work came from. Um, mm. But in, in a lot of ways, it wasn't really my, my choice, right? Like I, I was born <laughs> into it, <laughs> yes. like I'm just kind of continuing the legacy, so. Continuing the legacy, that's great. And especially to say that we're not like, black is not a monolith. Mm -hmm. That's the biggest takeaway is that we all have our own experiences, our own histories. And it's unfortunate that when we come to a white dominant space that it almost gets like erased. Yeah. However, you know, if you're, we're intentional about it, we can acknowledge all of our histories while also working together and creating yeah, a sure. common identity and a common community within this uh, place we call Montreal or Well, it's like Chichake. really interesting where, you know, okay, so let's say I go back to Haiti or I go back to Cuba, right? There's no, um, because there's no, like the, the dominant population mm -hmm. is Haitian or Cuban, there's no like question about your identity on that level. And so it, it actually allows for really like um, deeper, more interesting conversations about what your actual interests, um, struggles, uh, 
priorities are and, are and so on and so forth, right? Because mm -hmm. there's like this sense of like, well, we're, we're all kind of the same. And so mm -hmm. where are we different and how do we um, manage that work through that? How do we kind of work together and so on and so forth? And it's like interesting because here I find that um, the debate about what black is in the first place is really mm -hmm. a distraction, right? Like it's a distraction Absolutely. of like, well, let's see if we can kind of divide and conquer them and make them kind of be so obsessed with what the terminology is mm -hmm. in order for them to never actually get to a point where they're working together and doing something good, you know? And so, um, yeah, for, for all of those reasons, I kind of just like, I have, I know that there's uh, the term black can be charged, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and I know that there is issues and if, you know, if, um, if somebody wants to have that conversation with me, like deeply and truly, I'm um, very open to that. But in terms of like when I'm doing the, the work that I'm doing, like I don't really, I, I'm not gonna spend my time um, obsessing over that when I know that there's so much more that can be done, right? Absolutely, asking what island you come from and as it really, you know, it's still, you're still getting healthcare, whatever you receive, <laughs> whether it be a Haitian, whether you be from St. Exactly. Lucia, you know, mm -hmm. it doesn't really uh, make a difference. However, it does, make a difference be when you're getting treated from someone who is not black I find that's where it really highlights you highlight the differences and the different experiences and the different um, ways of, of being in relation with each other and so what were your experiences in healthcare you said like there you know you couldn't get away from it um, working yeah. in the black community health and so I'm wondering um, what was the beginning what started sparked that in you um so it's funny, I, my, my relationship with health has been, um, it's a little bit charged, right? So um, my, my father was a psychiatrist and my mom, uh, you know, is, is still around. My, my dad passed away, but my mom is, uh, um, she's retired now and she was an educator for the most, like the longest career that she had. She had many careers, but like she was an educator and a school principal for the longest part. And, um, and so I kind of, I feel like I've always mm, walked the line between those two worlds, right? Health and education and, uh, and how um, important and integral they are in terms of um, community building, in terms of what wellness means for individuals and so on and so forth. Um, and the reason I say that health was charged is because um, there's been a lot of mental health um, difficulties in my family. Mm -hmm. And um, and in a lot of ways, I've always I've always wanted to work in healthcare, but I've also always not wanted to work in healthcare because of the the types of caregiving um, dynamics that have happened in my family. Where uh, yeah, where I've often become, <laughs> become the caregiver, you know, whether or not I wanted to, and at a very young age, and so on and so forth. But anyway. If it was in a neutral world, let's say, um, from, a, like, from a very young age, I was really interested in health. I wanted to be a doctor and the whole thing. And then um, life kind of happened. Um, and through especially my late teenage years and my early university years, um, a few of my family members struggled a lot with mental health and um, the lack of support from institutions mm -hmm. and and I mean, not just at health institution, but other social institutions, right? So like, um, it's not easy to get care for someone who doesn't want um, care. And that can get really messy on a legal level. It can get really messy on a like interpersonal family dynamics and so on and so forth. Um, and the way in which me um, mental health is, was talked about, still is to a certain degree, but I think that things have changed a lot in the last 10 years. Um, made that really complex and mm -hmm. um, and then add the layer of blackness and then things get really really complex right and so um, so yeah so that period of time in my life made me kind of have an aversion to the healthcare system like I was frustrated right that um, these people who are supposed to to aid us are not able to because of these kind of arbitrary laws and these like um, like really not understanding that um, when someone comes to you and says that they need care for their family member, it's not, it's not something to be taken lightly, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then I spent kind of a lot of years being like, okay, well, I don't wanna think about health, let me work in community, right? <laughs> As if 
health is not part of community. <laughs> and obviously at every corner I would keep, like I'd encounter it again, right? Like there would be, um, you know, I did my bachelor's in science and I, and I was a massage therapist. And, and so it's like I, I kept on encountering health concerns right like it would be mm -hmm. like whether it be in terms of mental wellness whether it be in terms of physical wellness aging and so on and so on um and then the wellness of my own family as well right like so when like i was saying like in my family there's um mental health concerns but then also my mom aging um and then i had a kid and then i had my own like ma maternal um wellness experiences that were um, largely awful, <laughs> really, to be honest, right? Horrific, so yeah. <laughs> all these things kept on happening, and um, and because I have a bit of a like natural advocate um, like tendencies, mm -hmm. I would end up in these um, caregiving roles um, and advocate roles where I was talking about health again and again and again and again, and then even in my you know last role as um, when I was working in the, at the Black Perspectives office, like uh, whether it came, like you can't really talk about social justice, you can't talk about institutional change without talking about the wellness of students, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's, it's those things kind of have to be in conversation with one another. Um, and so again, I would like encounter health again and again and again. Um, and then I took a really big hit on my own personal health. Yeah. Um, and that was the wake up call to kind of shift things um, because as a care as a caregiver, I can't afford to be sick. Like it's, that is really not something I can afford to, to do, you know, and so yeah. um, and so I had to really flip the script and change the way in which I was approaching my own health. Um, and then and then beca health became kind of a priority in terms of my conversations. And so I unplugged, I unplugged for like a good, I'd say about four or five months, didn't do anything, just kind of let things simmer. And, um, and then it's like, as soon as I started like revving my brain up again, it was like, okay, no, like I wanna talk about um, black community health, like at the forefront of what I'm doing as opposed to kind of um, just kind of continuously walking around the subject, right? Like, yeah. how, what would it look like if I went straight in? Prioritizing that. Yeah. Yeah, so you you mentioned a, a whole bunch of stuff that I would like to touch upon and really talk about how you mentioned your Bachelor of Science. And I find when we talk about health, um, we don't, we think only physical. And you brought up mental, you brought up community, you brought up social. There is just so many aspects of self that we need to take care of, spiritual, that is, um, when we think about it, um, it's weird how we study it, how it's kind of divided up and separated into different sections and it's not all together as one. It's not in a holistic point of view. And so considering that you, your experience as a caregiver at such a young age and now as a caregiver now, um, you mentioned the term sandwich caregiver in your research. And I'm wondering more about that in terms of your ex past experiences of childhood having to um, be a caregiver but not necessarily want to be and now in this role where you kind of you are with your mom as well as you're with your son yeah for sure um yeah so sa sa when people talk about sandwich caregiving i mean commonly what they're talking about is the um what we've seen recently of um uh, people who are caregiving for their parents at the same time as caregiving for their children, right? And so this generation of, um, partly because we're, we're having kids later in life. And so, um, and so like we could have, you know, you could have a child somewhat later in your life and then your parents are aging significantly. In my case, it's even more so because my mom had me in her later life. And so when I had my kid at a, decent age, age, whatever, like there's a really big gap between um, their ages, right? So there's 75 years between my kid and my mom. And so um, it splits my brain <laughs> really different ways that I hadn't necessarily anticipated because I didn't necessarily prepare for, I don't think anyone prepares us for our parents aging, um, particularly not for what black aging looks like in a, a largely white country, right? Um, and uh, yeah, so that, that was really 
eye-opening in a lot of ways. Um, and it's different than the type of caregiving that I was doing uh, when I was younger because, um, so some of the roles that I had as, as in caregiving when I was younger, my mom was um, a foster parent. So I I've been a so foster sibling to s several, several um, children um, who at the time, I don't know if I could really consider them children because I was a child too, but you know, whatever. And then, um, and then some of my s siblings also, my like biological siblings needed um, support. And so uh, it was weird because it, at that time there was a lot of, of support to be, a lot of work to be done, right? Like I did a lot of the day-to-day the -day caregiving, but I didn't really have that much agency in the sense that I wasn't actually the formal leader of the household, right? And that's like a really um, difficult, it's, yeah, it's a difficult position to be in because you don't, it's not like the way it's not the way you are imagining things to happen. You're kind of taking whatever the leader is saying and hoping exactly. You don't have authority. <laughs> you don't have any sort of authority, <laughs> and um, yeah, no, it was kind of a difficult dynamic, right? So, um, so my mom was a school pr principal at the time, and so she'd be gone for long, long hours in the day, and so there, there's a sense of like, I am the leader when she's not there, but. Um, but yeah, and how do you kind of ha create those like that that dynamic of respect when you're maybe like a year or two older than everyone else and, and things like that? So, or even younger than um, some of my siblings in, in other cases. Um, now I have really different type of challenges where in the um, I'm the only adult <laughs> really, right? Like my mom's obviously an adult, but in terms of like the administrative decision making. Um, I'm the only person that does a lot of that work. And so there's a, a certain level of weight <laughs> and, uh, on your shoulders of like, I hope that I'm making the right decision. I hope I'm doing the right thing. Um, like tr constantly wanting to feel like you're on top of, of um, what's coming up next. Um, but then also not really having um, anyone to brainstorm with. I think that that's one of the things that I find so difficult is that um, I don't know what it feels like to be 80. I can't remember what it feels like to be five. And yet I'm here trying to kind of navigate all that um, and anticipate their needs and um, find ways for them to feel uh, empowered in the decision making, find ways to make them participate in the decision making, even if they don't, they would really leave the, re uh, the reins to me if it was up to them, right? And so, um, yeah, it's a really different type of caregiving that, that I'm doing now. and. Um, I feel, yeah, I feel good about um, the position that I'm in. I feel, I, I feel really blessed actually to, for, for my family members to have so much faith in me and to, um, to be able to, you know, as much as possible be in, intentional about the, um, how we move through life together. Um, but it is a really odd position to be um, sandwiched between these two very different generations um, and to not have support in that uh, and to to be also engaging with people who who don't necessarily have an intentional vision of what they want for their lives right and so how do you um, do that work with them to, it's it's definitely challenging um, and then also to not really have peers that are going through the same thing right so um, most of my cohort of like friends like my age group um, don't have children and their parents are significantly younger and they're not um, dealing with any of those like day-to-day -day challenges that I have and so it's it's uh, it's it, it's challenging to to be on that kind of path on your own and to be trying to do a little bit of like the pave work um, if anything I find that my peers tend to come to me of like oh, you know that thing that you were dealing with five years ago? Can we chat about that? Versus like <laughs> someone who like is kind of relating to something that I, um, I'm dealing with in, in the current moment. But yeah, definitely, it's an odd situation. And so you, you're a single um, only child? No, I'm not. Um, we got a lot of siblings, but I'm uh, the one who takes on the, the larger responsibility of um, supporting my mom. And, and that caregiver role. And the caregiver role, mm -hmm. and, and actually, this re that's really interesting that you asked that because I think that there's an assumption that um, as if you have siblings, that things will be evenly distributed, 
um, which is, I, I just don't think that that's true in many different family dynamics. And there's also like many different reasons for that, right? So in my context, some of my siblings have um, like significant uh, mental health concerns that it, like, do, like uh, actually mean that I need to support them in other, in other ways. Um, but also it's, it's uh, with the assumption that, that everyone wants to um, participate in like, like I think that you know what we what, what family is is really different from one person to another, right? So you might have been you know grow up in the same kind of core family, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that will be um, continued and that might, like those values and that structure will continue um, from one sibling to the next, right? And so uh, that's been really I opening for me is just to, to realize that though I have siblings who I can relate to in other ways, um, like we share like common life memories and so on and so forth, that doesn't mean that I'm, I'm supported in terms of the, the day to day. And that's really interesting to think about how you have assumed that caregiver role out from considering the rest of your siblings um, has also had a similar experience and, and parentage and all of that. But do you think that has anything to do with um, being a Black woman and the fact that our identity has been so much shaped by this caregiver role that I, I feel like almost when you're saying that you kind of distance yourself from it by going into community, uh, distance yourself from help by going to community, is it almost sort of rejecting the narrative that, hey, I don't need to take care of all y'all, like you got to take care of me and, and all of that. And I'm just wondering what are your thoughts about that as a Black woman? Um, yeah, for sure. I mean, I think... And I like, um, there's a couple of things that happened. I think that um, I'm the last biological child of my mom. And so I think that there's a lot there. Um, in Creole, we say tzibut trip, which is like, um, I don't know how you, you would even tra translate that, but it's like essentially like you, you're the end of my intestine, right? Like you're the last one that came out, you're the last piece of you know, whatever that came out of my belly, right? And so um, I think that because of that, I have a very specific type of bond with my mom. Um, that, and also that I, I witnessed things that were really different than what my siblings have witnessed in terms of living with her. So there's a significant age gap between me and my, my siblings. So one of my siblings is, is you know, 12 years older and I have one that's like 23 years older. And so there's really the, the version of mom that I have in mind is really different than the version of mom that they have in mind. If anything, I feel like they still rely on her as like in the same in a very typical child parent relationship, while my relationship with her, um, because she was also significantly older when she had me, has always been a little bit more considerate of her aging. Mm, so, and evolving yeah and evolving yeah. that relationship yeah and like seeing it really firsthand you know what mm. I mean like I, I was definitely the one that like noticed the 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 changes in her memory and and all of these things that um my siblings wouldn't have ne necessarily even seen because they weren't living in the house mm -hmm. um so that's one one dynamic I think um the way that like the context of how you grow up is one thing and then of course gender is is a huge part of it um uh and even in, in the sense of why I felt brazen enough, let's say, to decide to have a child of my own. Mm. Um, because, so my mom was a single parent. Um, she's a widow. And, um, and that has really f shaped how I, what I think is possible, right? So my, my father passed away when I was five. And so I don't have very um, strong, like rooted memories of him. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, but I do have very strong rooted memories of my mom, like um, raising me without, with what from my, at least my child eyes seemed like a very, very smooth, like she had it down kind Journey, of thing. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, you got this like in the bag, this is, this is really good. So, um, and so it, it never, you know, it's, it's funny when people are all always like, oh, wow, you like just decided to be a single parent. I'm like, I mean, it's like, it, the prototype was so good that I didn't think that it was like an odd thing to even want to do. Um, and, and then also my, my mom's mom was the same. She was a single parent as well. Same thing, widow um, with, I think my um, mom's father passed away like 
the, you know, the same year that she was born or something of the sort. And so my mom doesn't have any recollections of her father. Um, and so there's this legacy of, of matriarchs that are, is just really like, this is how things are done and it's not, it's not odd. Um, and then I see like, so that was in my personal kind of like family legacy, but then also around me, right? You know, when I look from family to family, even when there were um, very active men in the families, there was a lot of leadership coming from the women, right? And, um, and often pe the people I would see the most cause they're cooking and they're chatting and they're like really active in the community. Um, so, yeah, so I think that that, as like growing up as a girl in that environment, it A, made me very comfortable taking on leadership roles. Like that's not something that ever felt difficult for me. And, um, and I think that that's actually one of the things that I encounter the most when it comes to gender conversations um, with people who are not necessarily um, from Haitian households, mm. um, is that often this idea of like, uh, as a woman that like I, um, that you would be kind of um, undervalued. Subservient is, almost? Yeah, is, is, is really not my experience, right? Like I never actually experienced that at all. Like the women, like there are definitely negative um, gender dynamics in Haitian families as well, for sure. Um, and in Haitian like society. However, in terms of like whether or not a Haitian woman is competent is <laughs> not, it's just not a question, you know what I mean? Like that's not, that's never, um, I wouldn't even have occurred to me, right? And so the, the confidence in which I can walk into a space and know that I can lead is not, it's just not odd to me at all. Um, but the setback of that also means that there is um, a lack of expectation that will be supported, mm -hmm. right? Exactly. And, so, and so in my personal, very like my own like home lineage, it's like, I don't expect it because I've never actually seen a man leader. And it's not at all because I don't think that black men are not important supporters and leaders in the community. It's just literally in my family lineage, I haven't really experienced it um, in the household. Mm -hmm. I have a like, very strong mom, black male cousins who like, uh, who have ex shown me what that means. But in terms of what it, what it looks like on a day to day in a household, it's really different. Um, which means that I don't necessarily know what to ask for, how to ask for help. What the, what does that even look like? It's, if it's just very, like I have a tendency to, um, look for female collaborators. I mm -hmm. look, you know what I mean? Because that's kind of what, um, the systems around me have looked like for the, for the most part. Um, and I think that that's, the reality of, of, you know, social, um, adaptation, right? It's mm -hmm. like you kind of emulate what you've experienced. And so we see that a lot in the healthcare system, Absolutely. um, is that we see that so many women, um, end up in these healthcare positions because it's very natural, right? Like if, if everyone was a doctor, nurse, uh, you know, like a midwife, et cetera, in your family, like it's not, it's a no brainer that you'd, you'd kind of continue that Absolutely. legacy, right? Like if you, if you do something else, it's really cause you're trying to be, um, walk the unbeaten path, which is totally fine as well. But it's, I think that that's not, a like it, for me, it would never be a, a, a question that as a woman, that's one of the things that I'm not only, um, good at, Mm -hmm. but that it, it fits very well in my narrative of what care looks like in households as well as in he healthcare institutions. Yes, because as you were saying, at home, those were your caregivers were black women around yeah. those surrounding you. And so of course, coming, moving forward, who would you ask for help and support and care yeah. from would be other black women for sure. And so um, why is home, you center a lot around the home, I, I feel in your work and is it because of that context of your childhood of what you've experienced within that home that has pushed um, um that has moved you forward in your work yeah for sure home is really important um because we live in um canada <laughs> <laughs> um really is so it, it's funny so when i went back to my mom's um native village in in haiti i realized that in that context home is the entire village and that's, there's like, you know, mm. even literally in the way that people live, right? I mean, obviously it's a hotter country, but it's like, people don't spend a lot of time in the house. Like it's, <laughs> it's kind of odd to be like, 
in the home all day. You, know what I mean? you just that's sleep. Not... You just go home to sleep <laughs> and like, that's you go it. Home and sleep. Like even cooking happens outside. Like everything happens outside. Like um, it might happen in the courtyard, let's say, right? So um, uh, the way in which um, Haitian homes are, a lot of people have like these courtyards. Mm -hmm. And so you, you could do a lot of the stuff out, out in the courtyard. You might be out in the community. You might be at the market, et cetera. But you won't be like sitting in the like house all day, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, while here, um, as a black person, your home is your haven, right? It's, uh, it is the, the space in which you get to be your most authentic self. It's where your heritage has space. It's where your, the, the smells that you're used to, the food that you're used to, the pictures, the images, the books, like the way in which I intentionally shape my home for my child is <laughs> like it's I, like I'm I'm really creating a narrative in that space, right? Like I want him to feel like this space is you in all shapes and forms, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, actually, Bell Hooks writes about this about how uh, the home, like what that means for for Black communities, um, um, particularly when, when like Black communities were enslaved, and even something as simple as like uh, having a hut to yourself, like what that means to be able to carve that space within that. Um, and because of that, like a lot of our activism work, our advocacy, our love for each other, our care work, um, all of that, our educating for the future, our like preparing them for what might, they might have to deal with out in the world, all of this happens in the home. It, mm -hmm. it does happen in the community as well when we manage to create these extensions, right, in like community centers and, and all of that. Um, but even that, like the, when they walk from the home to the community center, they might not feel at home in those streets, right, yeah. like as they walk, which is really different than like what I was saying when I went to my mom's village in Haiti, like I felt at home while I was walking down the street, right? Like mm -hmm. I'm not, it's not like I have to have now my guard up in a really different type of way. Um, and so, yeah, so I think of, um, about the home a lot because I think of the revolutionary ways in which, um, often women, but I think black families in general, um, manage to somehow in this crazy world make their black children and families love who they are, even though as soon as they walk out of the door, there'll be people kind of negating their experience. Yes. Right, like how, like I, I think about the fact that like I could even feel confident speaking here right now mm -hmm. and feel like at home in my skin, feel um, loved and cared for. Like not that the the microaggressions and the the systemic racism don't imp impact me. Of course they do, right? Like mm -hmm. that's the, um, that's just the reality of what we live. But it, but the the fact that despite that, despite that happening on a day to day basis, despite the things, the crazy things I've heard in life, I can still like walk. And like and be well, right? Like I can laugh, I can cry, I can, you know what I mean? Like I'm a human Absolutely. being. Absolutely. Um, and I think that for me, that is because I have a home. And I think if I didn't, if I didn't have a home that where I could be fully anik, fully mm -hmm. be a black person, fully be, you know, like shed all of what like the guard that I have to have when I'm outside. Yeah, the layers they have to put on, the armor they have to put on, you get to just let it go. Just be, right? And so if I if I didn't have that, um, like that, it would be really, really, really hard to, to navigate this world for sure. And so um, it's, it's such an interesting space to me, particularly yeah. in North America. And I um, associate that to how we're able to navigate other spaces, right? So whether that be work or school, I thought about it a lot as, in terms of school when I was doing the, the BPO, right? Because I really wanted the BPO to be that home away from home for students, right? Um, and then, yeah, so it's like when we're talking about health, then whoever is carving that space the caregivers often, right? Mm -hmm. and, the, and there might be multiple, right? It's not, a caregiver is not necessarily always the mom. It's not necessarily always the, like, whatever, right? Caregivers um, whoever is like intentionally carving that space, they're really important um, pieces in navigating 
the health of, of the family mm -hmm. outside of the home, right? So whether that be something as simple as like translating, um, you know, the, the prescription that a doctor gave to your grandma who doesn't speak French or English or whatever, right? Yeah. Or laying um, out the pill bottles, you know, exactly, to spread it like, out. Like all those things, right? Like that means that you are, you are putting humanity into that person. Definitely. And creating a safety. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, with, without your help, without this simple action that you did, um, they wouldn't necessarily have the same access to feeling human and care um, when, because the world is, is not helping them, right? Like, I, I don't know if you've ever experienced that, but I've, I've uh, especially with elders, where you go, you know, you, you'll go to a pharmacy or whatever, and, and like whoever's working that day is like impatient and doesn't want to help them and the person's trying to figure it out and et cetera. And you can see the like distress in that person's like being, right? Of just like, I don't understand this. I'm not being helped. And then I'm going to leave here without any of the information that I need, which means that essentially I can't do anything with what exactly. I was given, right? Um, and it just, it is like for me, one of the most heartbreaking things to see is, is like, wow, like this person um, doesn't get to be who they are and advocate for themselves and, and be a full person because whoever's in the space doesn't have patience for them. Definitely. Right? And it's like, and I can also understand on the flip side, I can understand the impatience that's happening in that moment because we do like really, we put a lot of stressors on our um, healthcare professionals and et cetera. And so yes. it's like, um, if each, pharmacist spent like 45 minutes with each, you know what I mean? It doesn't exactly. really make sense. And so that, then there has to be other people in the, the mix, right? And it's Absolutely. Like, um, and so the people. Exactly. And in the home plays such a big role in Black community health. Yeah. And it's crazy for me to think how just now Western medicine is catching up to it, is catching up to questioning about the home. You know, when you, someone, you see someone in the hospital, you know, they don't ask, okay, how is your home? Do you have people who can take after I give you this prescription? Will you be able to get it done? Will someone be able to help you? They're just starting to realize that they need to be asking these questions. And it's, pretty um pretty insane how much how the home is so overlooked in our well-being oh my gosh, and how well we are and I find especially growing up in a white household my well-being especially as a black woman was so was always challenged and I was always questioning wondering trying to pinpoint the anxiety and why I was not feeling safe and how much I had to find other places of feeling home outside of within that home and then home can mean anything like you said it can mean a, a household it can mean a village it can mean it can extend to the whole community of having a home in the community and being able to go see whoever you need to see and i think that's so important uh, in your work no, to highlight sure. that and, and it's like with also because you know the the reality is that as um black people in the world we often have to have multiple identities right mm -hmm. so you might be actually surrounded by people, but you might not be surrounded by um, people who truly know you or who truly can offer you care. So for example, um, I had a couple of, um, like I had to do, go to the clinic for a couple of things and one of the procedures that was getting done, um, they, they told me I needed somebody to come and pick me up. And it was so funny because I'm like, I'm usually the one that goes and picks up people. And so I was like, oh man, who am I gonna call to, to come <laughs> and pick me up? And it was like, interesting because in that moment like I was doing like my direct of people and I see people on a day-to-day -day basis I have so many people that I encounter right but often it's work or mm -hmm. school or whatever and it's like because um part of the way in which I navigate the world as a black woman is that I have very different identities for all of these spaces mm -hmm. um who I know at work um, might not know another side of my like blackness and I might not want to be like open that up for them for Exposed. very like survival <laughs> reasons, right? Of course. And so, and so that, that it can get very complex, right? It can get really um, difficult to, to get care from the community that's around you. You might be mm -hmm. actually well surrounded in numbers, but you're not, you might not have the type of quality care that you need in order to, to, to feel supported in this world. Um, so yeah, and so that, that's why my research is so focused on, on caregiving and, um, 
not only what caregiving looks like in black homes and black families, um, and I use the word black families very broadly, right, because family can be any sort of um, uh, structure and, and makeup, um, but then also I'm really interested in, in what it means, like what, what type of caregiving are we talking about? Is mm -hmm. it, are we talking about somebody who comes by the house once a month? Are we talking about people who live with you? Um, are we talking about people who have been um, educated in the type of services that you need? Are we talking about someone who's just as lost in the system as you are? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, um, like and holding. Like, yeah, well, I mean, also like, you know, it's funny because um, in, as, like, I look at the aging population a lot. And so in the aging population, it's, all, it's really interesting because there'll be like a couple that they're, they're both aging and whoever is the one that's less, <laughs> who has less kind of like that. <laughs> Who's <laughs> taking better care of themselves. So <laughs> that person becomes the, the caregiver. And, so, and it's really interesting because it's like, well, I mean, you also need care too. So, so how much are you actually able to really offer um, the, like the, the, the quality of caregiving that we would like um, our community to have so yeah and that's really interesting in terms of your research of looking at different kinds of care and caregivers i'm wondering in your, when we're talking about when we're talking about caregivers are you specifically referring to family like you said family means everything but just family in general or are we talking about healthcare workers as well are we separating them out what how are your how are you thinking about categorizing these these caregiving roles and also the different types of care yeah, as you mentioned well, i'm i'm really at the very beginning of my research but right now i'm i'm very um loose with that that meaning i'm trying to to actually enter in conversations with our community to understand what they they even consider to be caregiving right like yeah. i think that um for me calling myself a caregiver was actually really important and empowering because um at one point i felt suffocated <laughs> like i felt like like i if i was if i still just called myself a daughter like, I, I was just like, this is not fair. <laughs> like, this is really heavy. I feel tired. I'm like, I, just, like, I don't understand what's happening. Like, I, don't, I didn't understand the dynamic shift. It was mm -hmm. really, really hard for me. Um, and I'm someone who vocabulary helps me. It helps me kind of work through things. Um, and so when I started talking about myself as a caregiver, it really shifted um, how I can even enter this conversation. And it allowed me to find uh, a community of thought that was really different than just kind of being like, oh, whoa, like things have shifted in our family really, really quickly. Um, but I also know that that doesn't necessarily mean that um, who I would consider caregivers see themselves as such, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm very open with the, the terminology. Um, I know that the reality is, uh, is a lot of our uh, community members don't have access to either biological or even chosen family um, within proximity. Yep. Um, and sometimes caregiving could even look like somebody calling them once every two months, you know? And so um, uh, in terms of what that looks like on a day-to-day, -day, who they might consider a caregiver might be somebody who works at the CLSC, who, yeah. you know what I mean? So like exactly. all of these things. And so um, that's actually part of what I'm really interested in, of like understanding who are, who are the people that are our community turn to um, mm -hmm. and how do we um, weave them into these conversations around black community health and empower them in those conversations around black community health um, as really kind of uh, key, key players, key players in, in the future of what um, wellness lo will look like for us. Definitely, definitely. I find it's, yeah, who to, to target, to empower them, to say that I find it's really interesting to create, um, to think about new and healthier ways of the caregiving dynamic and to explore that because, like you said, caregiving is um, it can be seen as oppressive. It can be seen as like unwanted, almost a burden. And so how do you flip that around? And it's where you're also getting cared for at the same time. And I'm really wondering, in terms of this week and you also getting, you know, as a research caregiver and you're getting the care you need, um, what conversations will be happening this week and how will that be feeding into your, um, into your understanding of what caregiving is? I'm really excited for this week of conversation. So I, um, I invited um, three just phenomenal um, 
professionals in the world who, um, so the first person that we'll be speaking to is Kimani Daniel, who is um, a nurse um, who and an educator and has, is, is like, well, phenomenal, but also really looks at um, like per, uh, perinatal um, education as well as experiences and really just kind of thinks through like what does it mean for the maternal health of our community. Um, so I'm really excited to, to hear from, from that perspective, but also to think about uh, what does it mean for uh, black health professional in like when they're doing this type of work from inside a health institution, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I wanted to focus on different spaces in which we work in. So the health institution being one, um, the educational edu uh, institution being another one, of course. Um, and then after that, we'll be speaking to Ariane Metellus, who does, who's a doula and a community health advocate. And so as a doula, she also works in people's homes, right? Um, yes. and sometimes in their homes, sometimes in health institutions as well, sometimes in the community. And so it's going to be really interesting to kind of hear um, her perspective as someone who um, gets to kind of break that barrier sometimes and like, <laughs> what does it mean to go into somebody's home? Um, and then uh, Marlene Lopez, who works at the university and also does a lot of um, community advocacy work, um, particularly around um, sexual violence um, and what it looks like for, um, like what sexual health really, um, conversations look like for, for people who have experienced that sexual violence. And so that's gonna be another perspective that I really like because the, the advocacy work that we do, the educational work that we do in the community is so important. Um, and I think that that's, uh, yeah, like having these, these kind of three areas in conversation with each other during the same week, um, I'm really excited to see what kind of themes come up and what, um, yeah, where the conversation goes because I want to, I want to think about these spaces as spaces that ideally could be ours, yes. right? So, um, that reflect in our and us and our exactly. what we our values and what we believe in exactly and, right yeah. so when i think about you know i talked a lot about how the home is is our space in in black community um i mean ideally right like the, one of the things that we see with a lot with housing um instability and all of this that it, that's one of the things that is stripped away from black communities um but what i'd like to if i were kind of vision the future is that I'd have more of that um, village feel where like, mm -hmm. um, you know, when you go to see your doctor, you don't have your guard up <laughs> and you're not like worried, you know, you could actually go and be like, you know, I wanna talk about this cold and I'm not thinking about like, hmm, I wonder if this is gonna be a really racially oppressive experience. You know? Exactly. So, um, so what does that look like? And, and, I, and so I'm really excited to see these workers who are all in these different spaces as like um, black people who are doing this type of work, who know um, the systemic limitations of the spaces that they're in, but are still dedicated to, to working in those spaces, right? Um, I think that that's, uh, I'm always fascinated by that. I always think yes. that they're just so like, um, I, I find them to be double advocates, right? It's because it's like, you're holding space for your black community while also valuing the institution that you're in and, and knowing its worth and, um, and importance in the ecosystem, right? So it's like uh, somebody who works in hospitals knows that hospitals are important. We can't just kind of erase them off of the, the table in terms of the, the conversations that we're having. And so, um, yeah, I'm really excited to learn from all these people. Um, yes. it's, it just so happens that all, everyone that I'm interviewing is, is a black woman. Um, I am excited to have conversations with uh, black men in the future. I, I actually have a, a couple of interviews lined up later in the year. Um, but I think it's also very reflective of um, black health in Montreal. In yes. Montreal, right. So, you know, there's, there's articles about it everywhere of just like, if black women just quit all their jobs, <laughs> healthcare would take a major hit in Montreal. Like it would be, it'd be a real problem. So, um, so yeah, it's, I'm, I'm excited to kind of be with these, these people who are so crucial to, to overall health and wellness for yes. all people in the city, but also it, it, who are very actively thinking about what um, 
Black community health looks like. Yes, and I love how it's from different perspectives too and how intergenerational it is. It's not just, you're, we're talking about birth, we're talking about nursing, like and in institutions as well. And how does that reflect? I really find that it's gonna be such a valuable contribution, all these conversations to what makes up Black community health and how can we work together in making sure that we're all feeling supported. Um, and I'm wondering, how does this tie into your new initiative that, that new new initiative <laughs> um yeah, I actually I, I i picked the name partly because in, in english it sounds like new yeah um, so new n-o-u is a haitian pronoun um which means we us and ours right so that we use it in different contexts of, of how you kind of put it in the with a word and um i really wanted to i wanted to, i'm in a very um explorative phase in my life right now where I just want to um, soak in uh, the people around me, you know, like I, I had to take the lead in a lot of work for for a few years. And now I just want to kind of sit back and like watch or <laughs> just like smell the roses <laughs> around me. And um, and so part of that for me is to surround myself by by brilliant people like that's how I learn and um, and so with the new initiative, it's really just a research collective um, of people who are working on um, research around black communities um, from a, a black centric um, perspective, right? And so that could be looking at um, social disparities, that could be looking at um, culture and so on and so forth, but really just trying to um, think about what black centric research will look like um, we are just, just, just starting. This is the first project coming out of the new, new initiative. Um, and I'm very open to work with so many different people. I'm, yeah, it's, uh, it's exciting to kind of have me, I, like, I tend to create things when I want to make friends. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. I'm not even kidding. <laughs> like, I, <laughs> when I was <laughs> younger, I was, um, when I was younger, I had a radio show, um, called Say Word. And it was because I was shy. I wanted to meet hip hop artists in, in Montreal. And I was like, I can't just go like say hi and be like, oh, hey, what's up? And so I like created a context for me to be able to like go and socialize with them. And so I had this radio show. And so then it was like, that, that's how I got to interview a bunch of people and get um, participate in the music uh, um, scene in Montreal. And so I'm doing the same thing again. Like, That's amazing. Really, what I work? I want to work with people. I want to know people. And so I just kind of create like a value system and then I make new friends. That's amazing though, but if it worked before and it works now, that's so great. And oh, yeah. it's and it's so great, especially when you're in an exploratory phase to make new friends and they can lead you off to in different directions. And you're like, wow, I didn't even know. And so that's so great that to hear. <laughs> and, uh, I, I can't, I, this conversation can keep on going because I find there's just so much to unpack and we have just like tipped the iceberg. So I'm super excited to move it um, to hear the rest of the conversations this week. But before we end it off and I move it past it on to um, Anna. I just wanted to get your advice on what does caring look like for you yourself as a caregiver? Just a few words of what do you do to care for yourself or to have others care for you? What, how do you ask? Just because like you said, it's always hard. And so it'd be just nice to get some, um, some guidance before we, uh, in the upcoming week. I wish I had, uh... A nice, eloquent answer for you. I'm not good at it, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> That's the reality. I, um, I'm, re I'm really not good at it. Um, I think one of the things that I have noticed about myself is that I, um, and, I and I don't can necessarily condone this, do I think it's necessarily healthy, but I, um, I balance my responsibilities with being irresponsible. <laughs> love that. I love that. I like I need to um, lash out in different ways. So sometimes like I think that one of the things one of the byproducts of having to grow up so quick is that I'm very youthful at the same time. Um, so like if you look at my life on a like CV level, it looks very like professional and like oh, she's got her stuff together. She's a parent. She's really like you know, she's got her home and whatever. Um, but like at home, I'm like truly like all of 17 at most, <laughs> at very, very most. And 
Um, you know, like I dance in my underwear. I don't clean my dishes. I do, like I'm very teenaged yeah. in my way of being, and that that's my balance. Is that I love it, like that. it allows me to just like unplug and not feel like I don't take things. There's certain things that I just don't think are that serious. Like it doesn't. Like if the plate stays in the sink for three days, it stays in the sink for three days. It doesn't make a difference to me. My kid doesn't care. My mom doesn't care. It's not hurting anyone. <laughs> it's not hurting nobody. Like it's not, it's okay. And so exactly. that's how I, I do it. Um, I do wish, you know, like that's something that I've been working on in terms of the relationships I have um, and the re relationships I would like to have in my life of just, um, finding ways to communicate my needs better because I think that it's not that I don't communicate my needs but I tend to to state them as I tend to state what I'm living as facts and mm. not, without necessarily creating entry points for people right like if I'm having a hard time first of all I usually say after the time has passed um, and I don't create like entry points for people um, it's something that I wasn't necessarily taught and it's something that I definitely struggle with. Um, but I, but I also think it's, it's because it, it requires a lot of sharing life with people, mm -hmm. um, that this, uh, side of the world is not very open to in the first place. So it's like yeah. part of it is my own responsibility and I take that on for sure. Um, but there's a lot of it that that's like socially, we don't do that, right? Like people don't. Um, share family in the same ways that I, I was raised to. Um, people are very uh, heteronormative and he very, um, uh, what's that called, the, like the nuclear family? Oh, yes, uh, yes. Um, and so it's really hard to bust out of that, you know, it, even in queer context, right? Like sometimes like, um, it's like interesting, like in queer context, you're like, oh, it's gonna be so different and we're gonna like bust all these like social structures or whatever. And then you're like, oh, but we're actually we're reproducing the same ones, but like in different- <laughs> With different <laughs> words, with different with words. With different words and yeah. different like ways, you know, sexualities or whatever. Um, but but yeah, so like for me, it's it's been about trying to be as um, transparent about like relationships that I have in my life. For me, I want to share life with my people. Mm -hmm. And so um, part of sharing life means that you see me in all of my messiness. Like you need to understand 17 year old Anique for you to really like be part of her life. Um, and that I think that when people see you that fully and they get to see that your day to day, you don't need to ask for help in the same type of way because they see you, right? Mm -hmm. they, they know what's coming up and, and like they see the shift. And, and I realize it because I do that for other people as well. So, um, but yeah, mutual kind of responsibility of like creating space, but also people taking space. Yeah. And, um, but yeah, I'm not, I, I haven't, I haven't gotten there yet. I yeah. don't think that my relationships are at that point yet. I want oh. more of it for sure, but I'm not there yet. Um, and then the way that I cope with it in the meantime is by letting myself be irresponsible. That's amazing. You know, you know, eating cookies for supper, all that jazz. Oh I gosh, love that. For all <laughs> the time. I'm like, whatever. I don't care. My kid's happy. I'm happy. We're good. <laughs> oh, thank you so much, Anik, for sitting down with me and talking about your work. I can't, like I said, I can't wait to see what's up and coming. And there's so much happening in the space. So I'm so excited to be a part of this at the beginning of the conversation. Thank, thank you so you. much. And thank you so much, Alicia, for taking the time to join us virtually today. We hope to see you later on the week in the space when you're back. Um, and you can, what a great way to open up this week of conversation with by sharing your own experience and ideas with us. And I'm telling you, by Friday, we'll get the 17 year old and you can hear. With yeah. <laughs> I, need to, I need to see that <laughs> responsibility in action. <laughs> Anyhow, folks, for those of you joining us uh, on the live stream or in the Zoom, we do invite you back to the conversations happening this week that uh, Anik already spoke to. Check out the concordia.ca slash four uh, calendar of events to get all the details. We welcome you back in this virtual space or in person all week long. Anik has also set up some activities for you to take part in in the space. So you're welcome to drop by. We're open Monday to Friday, 10 to 6 for that. Okay, folks, we're going to close up the Zoom and the live stream. Thanks again. And until next time, bye, everybody. See you in person. Bye. bye.